worship with us at Starkville First United Methodist Church. We are glad you're here. A lot of folks we haven't seen in a long time. It's a delight to have you in the sanctuary. But we know also there are people watching on the other side of the screen. We're delighted that you are sharing this time with us as well. We also know that many of you would normally be 11 o'clock people, but there's some kind of game going on this afternoon. And so therefore, you have chosen this service. It's good to cross-culturally meet from 11 o'clock to 8.40, so we're glad you're here. Children have some spring break activities coming up. Pay attention to those. If you have some questions, check with Audrey on tying in with that. Also, be aware that Children's Ministry is offering a parenting study right now on Wednesday nights, and you are certainly invited to be part of that. College life groups are still going strong here in the middle of the semester. Sunday nights, 7 o'clock, Connection. If you've got any questions, see Charlie Harper, and he'll plug you into that. And then also, we are starting to make plans for our Easter lilies. Easter's just a few weeks away. We will be in services here, multiple services all day long, I think. And uh, we are placing Easter lilies in memory or in honor of somebody. If you'd like to make one of those donations, there are forms on the tables on your way out, or you can check with Donna in the church office, and we'll get that set up for you. And then finally, just a reminder, as things begin to get better health-wise, people are getting vaccines, we're continually evaluating our process for COVID-related protocols, and we'll be moving ahead with other steps in the weeks to come. But for the moment, we still got masks, we're still keeping our distance and kind of letting people who have been gone for a while feel comfortable back here in services in live person before we move on too far. So just be aware of that. Now let's go to the Lord as Charlie leads us this morning. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 103. We will read this responsively and the words will be on the screen for you. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. The steadfast love of the Lord is everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. To those who keep his covenant.
Will you stand with me this morning as we affirm our faith through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed? Those words will also be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you are still standing, take a moment. The sun is shining. It is baseball weekend again. The, the thing he had mentioned other before. Greet each other, fist bump, wave, make sure everybody knows they belong here. <laughs> Hey, it's Miss Miriam, and I hope you all are having a wonderful Sunday. Uh, I was just wondering, have you ever noticed how many rules you have to follow throughout your day? Like, what time you have to eat lunch, um, how you eat lunch, like you can't eat spaghetti with your hands, and you have rules about how you can treat people, like you can't hit them, you can't scream at them, you can't call them names. Well, when I was younger, I hated the rule that I had had to walk to class and I couldn't run to class. I thought running to class was the best way and I really didn't understand the rule, but then I eventually figured out that you can't just run everywhere you go because if everybody was running, they wouldn't pay as much attention to where they're going and we might run into things, run into people and get hurt. Well, when I was learning about laws when I was little, I used to play a game with my mom and I would go, I wonder why such and such law exists or like, I wonder why restaurants have all these rules around food you know, how they have to keep food off the floor, like in boxes, or they have to be in a fridge for a certain time, all those kind of rules. Well, my mom helped explain it to me, how um, food would not taste as good, it wouldn't be as clean, it wouldn't be safe for us to eat. Well, I also play that with rules of the road, watching my mom drive. Well, why do you have to always stop at the stop sign? Nobody's around. Well, if we all stopped whenever we wanted to stop or didn't stop, that would put us at risk, and there would be a lot of chaos in the road, and it would be difficult to drive. God gave us ten rules. We call them the Ten Commandments. God gave them to Moses on top of the mountain, and Moses brought them back to the Israelites when they were creating a new country. He did not want our lives to be chaotic. He wanted our lives to be better and wanted us to be better people. And we can't serve God when we're not obeying these rules, because if we're killing people, it's kind of hard to praise God. So the rules are basically don't kill people, don't be greedy, don't use God's name in vain, have one day of rest, which is usually Sunday. So just think about it the next time you're worried about the rules and how you don't want your life to be chaotic and that the rules are there for a reason. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the rules that you've given us. Even though we may not always understand why you gave us these rules, Lord, just please help us to follow your word and to always do what you want us to do, Lord. Amen. I don't like following rules sometimes either. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we come into your courts with praise. We come into the sanctuary. And we no longer take that for granted. But we are also reminded that we are never out of your presence. That no matter where we go, you go before us and behind us. You hem us in. Your hand is on our life. And for that, we praise you. We may not always understand the circumstances we are faced with, but we know that you are with us. Remind us of that, that no matter what we are facing right now, that you are with us. And because you are with us, we can endure anything. Because you are our hope, our reason for joy, our reason for peace, our reason to feel joy even in the face of trial. But I lift up those this morning who are facing all types of challenges, whether it be health-related 
or personal or financial or employment or whatever it is that is troubling our heart. We lay those concerns at your feet today because we know that you are with us in them. That you endured what we've endured and became one of us, obedient even to death on the cross so that we could be in relationship with you. And for that, that is a reason for hope. That is a reason for joy. And so now we look to you as our provider, as our sustainer, as our hope. And we ask that you would empower us as we live on mission for you. That those we come in contact with would know who we belong to. And know who is with us because we display your love poured out for us to them. Whether it be by being patient or charitable or kind, even with those we may or may not agree with. We pray that we would represent you as your ambassadors. That we would help your kingdom be done here. In fact, that's how we pray as the saints have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to move through these strange days, your church has been able to continue to be in ministry with children and youth here through our church and reaching out to others across our community. And we're able to do so because of the generosity that you bring to part of your commitment as the believer in Jesus Christ and your membership and involvement here at First United Methodist Church. We're very grateful for that. Remind you, there are multiple ways that you can give. You can drop something of paper value in the offering boxes on your way out the doors. Since we're not passing the plate, you can get out your phone and you can text. You can check the website. We will still take cash and paper. So uh, any way you can get it, we'll be glad to receive it. But know that we are a generous people. This church has a long history of allowing us to do ministry in a marvelous set of ways. And especially during this season, we are mindful of that. So God bless you all, and let's listen attentively as Carol lifts our hearts to the Lord as she 
leads us in our offertory today. During this season of Lent, we are taking a look at the biblical concept of covenant. And each week as we move through toward Holy Week, we are mindful of the preparations that God made through His people for His gift to the world through the death and the resurrection of His Son, Jesus. For our purposes, a covenant is a relationship between God and us. It's a pledge or a promise made by the Lord of the universe on behalf of His creation. It is not a negotiated contract. It is not an agreement between two equal parties. This is the sovereign king, and we are the servants. It's a God's promise, a promise that God makes, and He determines the conditions and the terms of this agreement. We have the responsibility of choosing to agree to it 
and then following whatever stipulations the Lord lays out. Today we hear the covenant which God established through His servant Moses. The story is found in Exodus 19. We're going to start in the middle of our passage and work our way to the ends. We're going to read together from the screen verses 5 and 6. And so let us join our hearts and our voices together as we share in God's Word. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, open our minds to these words and open our heart to the living word of Christ that we may be changed today and forever. Amen. So put yourself in their shoes. You're a hard-working member of Egyptian society and you contribute to so many things around you. And yet, here comes this new leader into town who looks down on you and your people, doesn't like to deal with you, and wants to begin to make it tougher and tougher for your kind to make it by on a daily basis. Finally, in desperation, you cry out for help, and God hears. God responds to their cry. He remembered His covenant promise to Abraham, and he began to move in action on their behalf. You know, you got to be careful sometimes when you pray, because the answer you get may not be the answer that you're looking for. God does respond. He sends the Israelites a rescuer, but look who he sends. He sends Moses, of all the people that God has to scrape out of the barrel of leadership. Moses is the guy. Now we see Moses now as a spiritual superhero, but that's not the way it looked when he first showed up on scene. He had run away from Egypt because he was scared, and God had to do all kinds of miraculous things to get him to head back to Egypt where he was being called. He was not any good at public speaking. He sure couldn't inspire crowds. He wasn't well-liked even by the very people he was being sent to help. In fact, when Moses started helping, things went from bad to worse. Of all the people God could have sent, he sent Moses. But it was God's plan, not our plan. Gradually, Moses did begin to get Pharaoh's attention with all the plagues that God sent upon the Egyptian people. And finally, the Pharaoh caved in and said, that's enough. You can go with your people. So they headed out. They were free from slavery. God saved the Israelites. But no sooner had they left for parts further east, headed back to the promised land, then they ran into a little bit of a problem. Water. Lots and lots of water. And no way to get across this Red Sea that they were facing. They began to get a little snarky with Moses. Wasn't it bad enough that we were slaves in Egypt? There were not enough graves for us there? You had to bring us out in the desert to die? Are you kidding me? Well, you know the story. God steps in in a mighty way. The Israelites cross the Red Sea. The Egyptians don't. God has saved his people. And so the cycle continues. Whereas before they had had too much water, well, now they don't have enough. So they start to whine to Moses. We're thirsty, Moses. We're not going to get very far out here in the desert. Whine, complain, grumble, moan. Once more, God steps in, takes care of things. The Israelites are saved, and they move on. Do you sense a pattern growing here? Now they're running out of food. 
more griping. Come on, Moses. At least in Egypt, even though we were slaves, we had plenty to eat. Can you get us some food? So God steps in, provides food in the form of quail and manna, and the Israelites eat heartily, and they are saved once more. And then just a few weeks later, they're at a place called Rephidim, and they are really having a problem because they're out of water yet once more. The constant griping is starting to get to their leader, Moses. And he complains to God. He said, God, I just can't stand it. These people are killing me. Literally, they want to kill me. I'm just about had enough, God. I don't want to be a leader anymore. So God steps in, rescues them, provides the water they need, and helps the Israelites defeat the Amalekites in a battle as a bonus. God is mighty. God saves. Finally, about three months after escaping from Egypt, they arrive at a place called Sinai. And that is where the story begins from chapter 9, verse 1. On the third moon after the Israelites had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They had journeyed from Rephidim and entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Your eyewitnesses, God's telling the Israelites, you saw it all. You've seen the proof of my mighty power and the ways in which I can save you, even caring for you in the desert and bringing here, bringing you here to safety at Sinai. You see, he wanted them to know it wasn't Moses who saved the people. It was God who saved the people. God chose that reluctant leader Moses on purpose. He wanted it to be clear that it was the action of the Lord who rescued them. This story is about worshiping a mighty God. In fact, for the Jewish people, for thousands of years, from that time to even this present day, this is part of the key story of their faith. God rescuing them, God's hand at work on their behalf. God saved them with no strings attached. It was unconditional. But there's more to the story. Go back to our key verse, verse 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. God sends forth a covenant for them. Now, we've seen God a couple of weeks ago establish a covenant for all the world through his servant Noah as he rescues Noah and his family and promises to heal the world covenant of faith was established then with Abraham, who God chose as a special leader for a special people in a special time. I have saved you, God is now telling the Israelites. Now, if, if, if you will obey me, you will be special. You will be blessed. You will be the chosen people. All too often, we really get a bad idea about the Jewish faith. We think it is a religion built around following a set of laws or a set of rules, but that's not really the point at all. Over time, Judaism, like so many religions, became legalistic, and Jesus would later argue with people like the Pharisees over following the rules, but not the spirit behind them. But that is not the core of the Old Testament faith. It's not about rules. It's about grace first, law second. God's love first, following the rules, comes next. Think about it. When did God give Israel the Ten Commandments? 
Did God hand down the tablets while they were still slaves in Egypt? Uh Uh-uh. They hardly even knew who Yahweh was. Did God then pull them out of Egypt only when they promised to follow the Ten Commandments, only when they got their act together? Did God rescue them? No, that wasn't a precondition for God to pull them out from under Pharaoh. God didn't ask the Israelites to obey until after he had acted in mighty ways to save them. God's covenant of obedience for all people begins with grace, and then God asks for obedience to his ways as a sign of a relationship, a commitment to God. Israel has seen the almighty salvation that God brings And those then who choose to become part of that covenant will be blessed if, conditional, if they obey. So what did the people of Israel do? Verse 7, so Moses came, summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. This sounded like a pretty good deal to the people of God. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They answered quickly, maybe a little too quickly. Because even while Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments etched in stone, All God's people were down at the foot of the mountain, breaking the rules as they went onto the tablets, starting with the first one, you shall have no other God before me. They made and worshiped the infamous golden calf. It's a great story. I encourage you to read it. They couldn't even wait for the covenant to get printed before they disobeyed it, before they broke it. So Aaron tells his brother Moses when all this is going on, he said, you know these people, they are prone to evil. God's people, they are prone to evil. And so they were. And so are we. A man and his wife were discussing their planned trip to the Holy Land, and my husband was getting all pretty excited about this, and he said, Wouldn't it be great we could go to Mount Sinai, climb to the top of the mountain, and just shout the Ten Commandments to the world? And his wife, who knew him better than anyone else, said, that will be great. But wouldn't it be better if we stayed home and kept the Ten Commandments? We would rather talk about God's laws and how great they are, then we would obey God's laws. But following the will of God is part of the agreement, part of the covenant. God could have wiped out the Israelites right then and there, probably should have wiped them out, but he didn't. God chose to remain faithful to his promise to his people, even in the face of blatant disobedience and breaking the covenant on the part of the people that he loved. Well, that's a good lesson, preacher. We sure love those Old Testament stories. Well, so do I. And the reason is because the stories of the Old Testament are the same as the stories of the New Testament. It's all one Bible, all one message, all one God. It's the same from one end to the other. Each of us here today is on a journey, a spiritual journey. We're on an exodus, if you will, from slavery to sin to freedom in Christ. We're headed to a promised land. The message that we hear during Lent is that God has acted to save you and to save me. We didn't do anything to earn it. It's God's gift to us. By God's mercy, we have been delivered from slavery to sin and death. We are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. God doesn't give us a list of do's and don'ts when we become a Christian and says, if you obey these rules, I'll save you. 
No, it's once we're saved, then God gives us the guidelines for us to live by. God calls for us to respond. He asks for obedience. But God does call us to follow. The Ten Commandments, by the way, is another series for another time, maybe later this fall. But suffice it to say, they are still in place. They are active as guidelines for living for God's people. And I would be remiss as a preacher if I did not recap them now. So here you go, straight out of the next chapter, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol, which is just what they did. Number three, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. The first four of those deal with our relationship to God. The remaining six deal with our relationship to one another. It's a package deal. Jesus would go on to simplify this and at the same time make it even more challenging. When he was asked what the greatest commandment was to be followed, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love other people. And the intersection of those two things is found at the cross because Jesus did just what he asked us to do. Love God with every fiber of your being and love people in the very same way. That's it. That's all. Jesus asked us just to do those two things. Granted, that encompasses everything we do, say, think, sleep, eat, all of it all comes under those rules, covers a lot of ground. But that's the idea. Because being a Christian is more than calling ourselves a Christian. It's about living like Christ. It's about being obedient to Jesus. Have no doubts that Jesus expects complete and total obedience in every single aspect of our lives. We are to do what he says do. We are to go where he says go, no matter what. We don't follow Christ out of fear of punishment, of hell. We don't respond just out of obligation. Well, Jesus said to do it. We don't even follow Christ and obey him because there's a promise out there dangling out there for us of heaven. We respond out of obedience because Christ loved us first and we owe all that we are, all that we have to him for his purposes. The good news, the gospel, is that God stood by the Israelites even when they weren't worth standing by. And God still stands by us even when we become disobedient. So, so what about me? What about you? Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind? I don't mean in the abstract, just a general question. I mean right now, this moment, Sunday morning. Is God your be-all and end-all, the focus of your life? And have you loved your neighbors even as you love yourself? Are you acting in real, tangible ways to touch the lives of your family, your friends, those in our community that you may not even know yet? Are we responding at all times in all ways with the love of God for the world that we claim in Jesus Christ? You know, God loves us already. There's nothing we can do to make God love us more. All we can do 
is respond to him with our whole heart, loving God and loving others. It's a covenant of obedience. God is keeping his end of the bargain. What about us? We're going to close with a time of prayer. The words will be on the screen for us to share aloud together. And as we pray, we will be praying these words that come for us from confession and obedience. So as we see the words on the screen that are not there, you'll listen to me pray. So let's pray. Make these your prayers as well. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, hear each of us as we pray our own silent prayers of confession and obedience to you. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God and amen. As we have been saved, so now we go forth in obedience out into the world. The ushers are going to escort you out, coming down these center aisles. And as you go, we are grateful again for your presence with us today, either here in this room or virtually, online, watching from your homes. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace. And all of God's people said, Amen.